American Constitutional History, Lecture 1, German and British Antecedents. The first thing to understand about the deep background of American constitutional law and American constitutional history are the earliest antecedents. And uh, as far as we know, that means the ancient Germans. Of course, English law is ultimately derived or at least descended from German law because the English as we know them um, first appear on the historic uh, scene with the migration in the medieval period of the Angles and Saxons into what is now England. England, of course, named for one of those Germanic groups, the Angles. The earliest description we have of those Germans comes from the classic Roman historian Tacitus. Tacitus is best known for two outstanding histories of early imperial Rome, one of them uh, the Annals of Imperial Rome. Uh, but what we're interested in here is a short tract that he wrote on the Germans in his day called Germania. This was published in AD 98. It tells, among other things, who the Germans were, which were the people just beyond the Limnes, just beyond the border of the Roman Empire. These then were the closest non-Romans uh, in Tacitus' awareness. What Tacitus provides is a general description of the life of the Romans, I'm sorry, the life of the Germans, but uh, what we're interested in here, of course, is the, the government of the Germans, and he does give a short description of that. He says that it was centered in each German town on an assembly, and this assembly uh, included the entire male citizenry, but only some few people were allowed to speak. Typically, those were people who were incumbent office holders and people who were significant for other reasons, perhaps for their past political experience, perhaps because of their uh, renown in war, perhaps for economic reasons. In any event, those few people from among the larger group were the ones who were allowed to uh, lead the uh, discussion in, and actually to speak in the assemblies. Apparently, the priests of each town set the agendas of the assemblies, and then the male citizenry at large was allowed to vote in the assemblies. We have, in our uh, American constitutional tradition, inherited what in uh, the 20th century came to be called the Saxon myth. This was a story very common in the 18th century among Whiggish, that is among a liberty minded, we might say, or parliamentary as opposed to royally inclined um, figures. The idea that there had been a major change made on British, uh, I should say English, legal institutions and in political life by the Norman Conquest. So according to this myth, before the Norman Conquest was a period of uh, great liberty among the English, with uh, government being a, a yoke that was lightly worn and with their uh, king, uh, ultimately Alfred um, is the kind of paradigmatic uh, medieval <clears throat> liberty-minded English king, basically the institutor of the modern um, legal tradition in England. And the rule of law, as opposed to despotism, through local courts, after the Norman Conquest, this Saxon myth says, you had a very different kind of society in England with a very hierarchical church and very hierarchical government. So essentially these dictatorially inclined uh, followers of Guillaume de Salo, William the Bastard, who of course at, at Hastings became William the Conqueror, and uh, King of England um, brought with them to England with their conquest of the indigenous people uh, their own ways. So although the church of course in Western Europe was essentially one church, the uh, Saxon myth said that it was far less centralized and hierarchical in England before 1066 than thereafter and this is blamed conveniently on the historic enemy of the English the French. The same was true of the government, where William the Conqueror, William the First, uh, 
uh, instituted a highly centralized state in which some very, very few nobles uh, were his immediate uh, advisors and uh, kind of administrators of his policy and where he had uh, sway throughout the kingdom. That model of government uh, apparently remained in effect until 1215 when there was a notable change through the promulgation of what was called in Latin Magna Carta. Magna Carta resulted from essentially a, a tax rebellion. Basically what had happened was that the famous Richard I, Richard the, the Lionheart, uh, Coeur de Leon, um, had made his name, won his renown with military exploits in the Levant, in the Middle East, during the Crusades. In the, during those Crusades and then after, of course, predictably, there had to be stiff fine, uh, stiff taxes imposed by the monarchy in England to pay for the wars the king was waging. And when Richard I uh, failed to return from Crusade, his brother, King John, was left the task of enforcing these taxes. John was not the heroic figure that his brother Richard had been and ultimately the barons rebelled against John. At Runnymede they extracted a document, Magna Carta, in which John agreed to uh, the limitation of his authority as king. He agreed to a couple of uh, important principles. First was that people couldn't be uh, punished without benefit of the law of the land, what today we would call due process of law. And secondly, there were limitations placed on his ability just to announce new taxes. Now commonly people say that these were rights of uh, Englishmen or rights in general, but in reality they were only being afforded to John's peers, uh, that is the, the peers who were the barons rebelling against him and forcing him to sign this Magna Carta at Runnymede. So this was not a, a provision that everybody in England was entitled to due process or that everybody in England was entitled to input before being taxed. But ultimately what was going to happen was that Whig lawyers would take this as a, a precedent. They would argue that this principle had been established in 1215 and, and lay there waiting to be extended so we come to the 17th century when there were significant uh, disputes between the crown and parliament. What happened essentially was that in the 16th century, for various reasons, Henry VIII, who had broke, who broke with the papacy uh, because of his desire to have a male heir, his father having come to the throne finally after a, a long period of civil war in England and Henry thinking that had to be avoided if possible. Uh, although Henry broke with the papacy and went through several wives, he did not end up with a hale and hearty male heir and ultimately his daughter, uh, Queen Elizabeth, became the Queen of England. The problem here was that it had been a millennium and a half since a woman had ruled in her own right in England and so um, Elizabeth decided that in case she were to take a husband, people would think naturally he was the king and she would fade into the background. And so it became her official policy that she was the virgin queen. That is that she would not marry. There would not be a person uh, to whom others could look as the ruler. Um, and she would not suffer the fate of, of being pushed into the background. And so, well, it was ironic that uh, Elizabeth ultimately became what historians today still regard as the greatest monarch in English history since her father had striven so mightily to avoid having her um, become queen. And it was also ironic that because she adopted the policy of being officially the virgin queen that she was right back in the same or the kingdom was right back in the same position as it would have been in had Henry VIII died without a male heir um, in the first place. So, what happened? Well, uh, ultimately, Elizabeth's cousin, uh, James VI of Scotland, was selected to replace her as King of England. So, James VI of Scotland is also James I of England. And when James I of England uh, ascended to the throne, he was asked by his some of his more devout Puritan uh, 
subjects in the southern kingdom, uh, whether he would now take the step of eliminating the episcopacy in England. After all, uh, James' Scottish kingdom was officially Presbyterian. There were no bishops there. And so Puritans thought, well, here's our chance. God has worked things out. We're, we have this Presbyterian king, and now no more bishops for us either. But so the story goes that when he, this idea was presented to him, James' response was, ah, no bishops, no king. In other words, he thought, that having a hierarchical structure of the church was a support to the crown, a support to the throne, and he was not going to be responsible for eliminating the episcopacy. Well, the 17th century saw increasing conflict between the crown and the parliament. Ultimately, the parliament was going to be dominated by Calvinists, that is, people we would now call Puritans. They were called Puritans by the end of the 17th century. And on the other hand, as I said, uh, James and then his successors, uh, the Stuart kings of England, uh, Charles I, Charles II, uh, in theory at least James II, uh, certainly they were not Puritans. The first three of them apparently were Episcopalian, and we'll come back to the, the uh, religious identity of the fourth of them, James II, in a few minutes. But on one hand, Episcopalian kings, on the other hand, Puritan parliaments, those uh, Episcopalian kings had a far different idea of the rightful authority of a monarch than their Puritan subjects did, and Ultimately, they were going to assert a right to unilateral policy making that uh, the Puritan parliaments in the end rejected. So, James I, uh, famously, one of his uh, courtiers is supposed to have said that the king, quote, the king is the law speaking. He actually said it in Latin, but the king is the law speaking. So that was his idea of the proper relationship between the crown and the parliament, and between the king and the ruled, and as I said before, he refused to abolish the episcopacy. He was succeeded by Charles I. Charles governed in an increasingly arbitrary way across his, uh, across his reign, and ultimately the parliament passed something called the Petition of Right, which it sent to him. It was presented by Sir Edward Cook, spelled Coke, pronounced Cook in England, champion of the common law, somebody who asserted that because of the common law precedents, there were actually restrictions on the king's authority even as early as the 1630s. Um, this petition of right restricted the king's powers in several ways. First of all, it said that the king would not be able to tax without asking his parliament to levy taxes. And this was contrary to the way that Charles had been behaving. Charles had to agree to this in the end. It said that the king should not, would not billet troops in England without asking Parliament. And in fact, um, as I said, the king had to agree to this. Uh, it deprived kings of their power unilaterally to imprison people, which Charles had been doing despite the historic uh, role of the writ of habeas corpus in the English kingdom. And actually, nowadays we have an idea of the the history of the writ of habeas corpus that's a, a bit romanticized, but um, still, Charles had been flouting the traditional protection of Englishmen from arbitrary imprisonment, and the, the, deck, the petition of right was going to see uh, him, his power in that area circumscribed. And finally, the petition of right said that the king couldn't declare martial law in England as he had been doing. So, in other words, what had been happening was that uh, Charles had been unable to wring money from the Parliament to support his foreign policy as he had hoped to do, and so he just began instituting a creation of new courts and levying of new taxes and various other um, billeting troops in private households and various other measures intended to enforce his essentially arbitrary rule. In 1641, these things came to a kind of head with the impeachment of the Earl of Strafford. Uh, Strafford was, for a time, Charles I's chief advisor, and apparently what Strafford did was give Charles advice about the arbitrariness with which he was free to rule the kingdom. In the end, Strafford told the king that since he had an army in Ireland, he could bring it to England and uh, use it to intimidate people in England. And when Parliament found out about this, the House impeached the Earl of Strafford, who then was tried before the House of Lords, convicted and executed for this contravention of the English Constitution. The House of Lords powers uh, 
when it came to uh, setting punishments for people who had been convicted in impeachment trials were uh, plenary. It could it could punish you in any way it wanted. It commonly it executed people and worked corruption of the blood, which was to say that it took not only their property but the property of all their descendants too. So this impeachment of the Earl of Strafford, deprivation of the king of his uh, chief advisor was a kind of prelude to the Civil War, the only Civil War in English history, which commenced the following year. The Civil War pit pitted supporters of the king, now called Cavaliers, generally Episcopalian on one side, against so-called Roundheads, uh, the Puritan supporters of the Parliament on the other side. And in 1649, finally, Charles lost the king lost and the parliament won the Civil War. The result of that, or one consequence, was that parliament staged a trial of the king. And when he was asked how he pled, Charles said he did not plead. Kings didn't plead. <laughs> this was not uh, consistent with his understanding of his relationship to his subjects. And so ultimately the parliament decided that he was flouting the law and showing disrespect, and they executed him. With the execution of Charles I came abolition not only of the monarchy, but also of the episcopacy and the House of Lords generally. So, of course, for a very long time, bishops in England had sat in the House of Lords. They were lords spiritual and sat with the lords temporal, the hereditary, mostly hereditary peers, um, in the House of Lords. That entire house was abolished along with the monarchy. And England was launched on an 11-year experiment in essentially Republican government. When those 11 years ended, um, with the death of the Lord Protector, as he was called, really a kind of Puritan dictator, a parliamentary dictator, Oliver Cromwell, and then with an inability, essentially, to decide what kind of government England should have in the wake of Oliver Cromwell's death. Uh, in 1660, the English um, essentially invited the Stuart family to return this time in the person of Charles II. Charles II um, came back and not only was the, the crown restored, but in the person, once again, of the Stuart family, although obviously not of Charles, who had been beheaded, Charles I, that is. But the restoration of Charles II also meant the restoration of the House of Lords, including both the Lords uh, Temporal and the Lords Spiritual. So once again, the Episcopal Church was going to be the Church of England. Um, the reign of Charles II was more or less a peaceful one from a constitutional point of view, but the, the problem arose when his brother, the former Duke of York, the fellow actually for whom New York State is named, uh, because he at one time was a proprietor of New York, um, James II ascended the throne in 1685. People had the idea that this was problematic, because James was married to a Catholic princess, and in fact, uh, people heard that their son had been baptized as a Catholic and were distraught at the prospect of the restoration of Catholic authority, papal authority in England. James finally was made to flee the kingdom. He certainly had the impression that if he didn't flee, he might suffer the fate of Charles I. So he validated people's suspicions that he was Catholic by fleeing first to France and ultimately to Italy, where he wound up as a Catholic cardinal. And today, James II is entombed in the Vatican, as you might expect of a Catholic cardinal. Well, in with James' disappearance from the scene uh, came uh, an opportunity for the Parliament to lay out a new uh, constitutional dispensation. This uh, removal, peaceful removal of the Catholic uh, and apparently arbitrary, arbitrarily inclined James II and his uh, replacement with uh, a monarchy um, constrained by Parliament's uh, rules um, in 1688 is, is a major turning point of um, English and Anglophone constitutional history. The Glorious Revolution is a starting point, really, for our contemporary understanding of the way that government ought to work. James II's flight and abdication left the way free for uh, 
parliament now styled the convention. It couldn't be a parliament without a monarch, so they called it the convention to issue what was called the Declaration of Right. The Declaration of Right laid out basic principles upon which parliament was going to insist uh, in reconstituting the government. Ultimately, the Declaration of Right was translated into the Bill of Rights in 1689. The Bill of Rights was a parliamentary statute agreed by William and Mary, the new joint monarchs, and I know it's it's nonsense to say joint monarchs, but diarchs, I don't think anybody ever calls them that. I mean, you do see reference to the diarchies and tetrarchies and so on among the ancient Romans, but um, commonly William and Mary are called the joint monarchs of uh, England after 1688 and 89. So William and Mary had to agree to the Bill of Rights, and they actually did agree to the Bill of Rights um, as a condition to taking the throne throne uh, that had been abandoned by Mary's father, uh, James II. So what did the Bill of Rights say? Well, what the Bill of Rights did was to lay out various kinds of steps that monarchs would no longer be allowed to take on their own. What it really created was what we now would call a constitutional monarchy, or in another way to see it is that more or less paved the path leading to today's figurehead monarchy in England. Monarchs, after the Bill of Rights, according to the Bill of Rights, were not permitted to establish courts or judge cases. That is, they could not create new courts, sit their own favorites on them, and decide essentially how cases would be decided. Uh, they also could not personally do uh, the deciding, which was a, a novel provision in English law. Actually, the common law had its origin in decisions of kings riding around the kingdom and making decisions personally and, and ultimately uh, they're appointing uh, judges to hear cases in their absence and then ordering that the decisions be collected so that the same principles could be applied over time to the same kinds of cases. Anyway, another major provision of the Bill of Rights that was that the monarchs were not allowed to institute taxes without parliamentary consent. Now, consent is the way to see it. In fact, the modern fiction of English taxation is that it's voluntary. And in fact, we're going to see when we get to talking about the American Revolution that one thing that the colonists in North America are going to insist upon is that they can't have their property taken from them except by the consent either of their representatives or themselves. So the, the fiction of Anglophone taxation is that all of these gifts to government are voluntary. Thirdly, another significant provision of the English Bill of Rights is that the king would not be able to punish petitioners. People would have the freedom of petition. You could ask the king to do whatever you wanted to ask him to do, and you would not suffer any penalty for that, as uh, had been the case certainly in the day of Charles, but um, the people had decided in England that they'd had enough of these Stuart abuses, and so we're laying out new rules. Um, another major provision of the Bill of Rights was that the English monarchs would not be able to maintain what were called standing armies. A standing army is one that the monarch had at his disposal in peacetime. And the tradition in England was that in wartime an army would be raised, taxes would be raised to pay for it, and then as soon as the war was won, the soldiers would be told to go home and the taxes would be cut back down to peacetime levels. People in England had the idea that one reason why they were free was that the king didn't just have an army at hand all the time to use to intimidate Parliament. And the Bill of Rights said that that was always going to be the case, that the king would never be able to raise an army uh, to use to intimidate Parliament. Remember the uh, issue with the Earl of Strafford, um, who had been executed at the order of the House of Lords because he had advised Charles I that Charles could use his Irish army to intimidate the English Parliament, so there wasn't going to be any more risk of that. The Bill of Rights also forbade the uh, English monarchs to disarm Protestant subjects. In other words, it said that if uh, a Protestant subject wanted to, he would be able to keep and bear arms. It prohibited the monarch from uh, taking any role in parliamentary elections. 
parliamentary elections were to be up to the commons to decide, not, of course, not the lords, but also not the monarch. He should have no role in them at all. And it also included a provision about a reasonable bail and cruel and unusual punishments. We're going to see those uh, terms again, of course, before the end of this uh, course.